Hello, and I would like to welcome with us today, Jackie Baxter. Um, thank you so much for coming and spending some time to share your journey with long COVID. I am so happy to be here and to be on the other side of the microphone. <laughs> we will talk a little bit more about that as we go through. Sure. Um, first of all, um, I've kind of known you for quite a long time. How did we meet? Yeah, so we were just discussing before we hit record how my sort of idea of time is just so warped at the moment. So I actually couldn't tell you how long ago it was, but it's probably a couple of years. Um, and we connected when you came and did a breathing session that I attended. And by this point, I had already breathing and it had already started to help me. So I remember coming along to the session that you did and thinking, oh my goodness, this person is speaking my language. Like, you know, <laughs> this is my sort of person. Um, but I think what you also were able to do was to kind of present yourself as a recovery as well, which I think up to that point, I hadn't really encountered maybe more than one people who had actually recovered from something chronic like this. So I think that was definitely something, <laughs> something that made me go, wow, okay. Um, and I think then I just emailed you and said, would you come on the podcast? Um, to which you said, yes. And here we are <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> several years later. Yeah. So, so for, for me, my recovery was from POTS, postural tachycardia syndrome which my symptoms started many years ago. So I'm I'm like 15 years down down the line now. Um, so you mentioned the podcast. Let, let's start off with that. T tell us about your podcast, because this is quite unique and significant. Sure. Um, so I think by the time I started the podcast, I'd been ill for maybe 18 months. So I was a March 2020 year. Uh, I was working from home that's probably something we can go into later because it wasn't a good idea but at the time I thought it was um and it was the summer about a year on just over a year on from when I got sick and summers for me were always throw all the stuff in the car, head for the hills, get out on the bike. Um, I'm a very outdoory person. So it was all of this, you know, summer was excitement. Summer was get away, do all of the things. And I was seeing the summer stretch out in front of me thinking I was, I was dreading it because it was just going to be this constant reminder of the things that I couldn't do. Um, and yet my partner was going to be off and doing some things and my friends were going to be off and doing some things. Um, so it was that that kind of maybe gave me the idea of I need a project, but something that I can do. And also shortly after that, I was then went on to sick leave and I felt awful for that. I mean, looking back on it, it was the right decision, but I just felt like I had nothing left. You know, work was like the only thing that I felt that I was actually able to do. And I can't remember exactly what gave me the idea, but I think it was this idea of being alone, feeling like, you know, it was just me, even though I knew it wasn't just me and there were support groups and there were all these other things. So I knew it wasn't just me, but it still felt very, very lonely. I thought, could I bring together some of these people's experience into something like a podcast where, where people could just feel more connected to each other? And that was kind of how it started out. And very early it started kind of um, a little bit stoned down a hill where I was interviewing people who were experts in their field. So I would, you know, see somebody who'd done a webinar and agonize over sending them an email and then eventually do it. And more often than not, they would say yes. And, you know, people who were specializing in dysautonomia, in breathing, in nutrition, uh, people who were researching different aspects of long COVID, and then people who were having the lived experience of it as well. And then I discovered that there were people who'd recovered. So then I was like, right, we need some of these people as well. We need to add recovery stories to the mix. Um, and, you know, it, I've described it before as a lifeline. And I think it really was a bit of a lifeline to me. Um, you know, a lot of the things that I found that helped me 
were things that I found through the podcast and then were able to share with people who were listening. And, you know, my my ego is really not so big as to think that I need people telling me I'm great. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that it's not it doesn't give me that nice fuzzy feeling when I get a message from someone saying this episode has made such a difference to me um, or, you know, hearing this recovery story has made me follow up that thing they suggested. And now I'm able to do such and such that I wasn't able to do before. And um, I think, yeah, it's, it's been really fun as well. You know, it's, it's something that I started kind of out of desperation almost. And, you know, it, it really has kind of brought me quite a lot of joy and new, um, new things that I can, you know, um, learn. It's been a, a learning curve, new skills. That's the word I was going for. Um, and, and connections with people as well. I think, you know, that is probably one of the silver linings from this is that I've connected with all these people across the world in all these different sort of specialties that I would never have met before. And, and here I am speaking to you, we would never have connected if it wasn't for this so um yeah it's it's been wild <laughs> one of the things i really appreciated about your podcast is the breadth of opinions that are there mm. um you've just got everything like you said you've got recovery score stories you've got um professionals who are expert in this area um you got a little bit about uh, while, while swimming which we were both really interested in um so yeah there's just something for everybody um which i really really appreciated and i i still listen so i'll put a link oh, if anybody is interested um so tell us about your journey with long covid i know you said it, your symptoms started in march 2020 um tell us what happened around that time yeah i'll i'll try to give you the short version um, otherwise we're still going to be here tomorrow um so yeah i was march 2020 i actually started feeling unwell about a week before the lockdown um so when the actual lockdown kicked in i didn't really notice um i was i was already sort of feeling dreadful by then um i think to start with i mean this it's hard to remember back, isn't it, to March 2020 or even to before because there were already people ill then. Um, but at that point, very much the message in the UK, certainly in Scotland, was that, you know, we don't need to be concerned. There were very few cases. I mean, there weren't, but there were very few confirmed cases around. And I was 30 at the time. I was very fit i would have considered myself completely healthy that's probably something we should return to as well um and um i i wasn't concerned um so then when i started getting unwell i didn't have any of the symptoms that we were told to look out for so i didn't think it was covid i just thought oh i've got a stomach bug this this is unfortunate because i have a lot on this week <laughs> and um uh yeah you know i didn't go into work the following day because i thought i feel awful i've got kids exams the next day so i will take today off will be fine tomorrow and everything will be right as rain and this repeated each day and i was getting more and more stressed out because i thought i'm letting all these people down um but i i literally of my bed so I can't go into work um it wasn't until about four or five days in when my breathing then started getting really 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 bad um to the point where my partner actually called the paramedics out and it was them that said this is COVID but you know they said you're fine um you're not actually dying even though you feel um and in a few days you'll be okay you know and even if it's another week you're gonna be fine so it was I, I didn't feel like I had anything particular to worry about, even at that point. Um, but things just didn't get better. You know, in, in some ways they got worse. The breathlessness carried on. Um, and then I just started developing other symptoms. You know, the heart rate one was the scariest probably. Um, and, you know, at the time, nobody knew about POTS. No one knew about dysautonomia. No one really knew about any of these things. Um, and I was just kind of lying there not getting better. Uh, so I spent about four weeks kind of basically in my bed. There was one day where I felt slightly better within that. So I decided to go outside 
and then <laughs> straight back to bed after that that wasn't a good idea um sort of weeks five and six I think I was pottering around the house and then at that point I started bits and pieces more um I mentioned I was a very active person exercise has always been how I have dealt with stuff so I started trying to walk around the block couldn't do it because I was just so breathless but I got some advice from somebody who said well actually you're just deconditioned because you've been in your bed for six weeks so actually what you need to do is push yourself so I tried to do that and I did that and I did that and I did that um and actually to be fair a couple of months it was working to the point where I then hit a wall and everything kind of fell apart from that point um so I suppose that was probably where sort of long COVID really kicked in up to that point I suppose it was sort of I don't know the tail end of an infection that I genuinely thought I was over um I thought you know this has been awful but you know at least it's done now so so from then on, it, it really was this kind of, you know, we call it a roller coaster. <laughs> it kind of was. Um, but I thought I was onto a winner with the whole exercise thing because it kind of had worked until it hadn't. So I did a little, um, but still kept pushing myself. And then I would crash and I'd end up in bed or on the couch. Then I would pick myself back up again. Then I would try again. And this longer than I would like to admit. Um, I'm an extremely stubborn person. So I thought, this, I'm just going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing this because I don't know anything else. Um, and then eventually, I think I started realizing that this wasn't working. But I didn't really know what else to do until around about a year on when I saw an Instagram post from someone who said, hey, breathing can help long COVID. And I thought, yeah right but I was like well you know what everything else I'm trying isn't working so maybe I should give this a shot and through that I then you know learned all about the sort of things like dysfunctional breathing and started understanding a whole load more about what was actually going on with me um but yeah up to this point it really had I mean what other symptoms did I have um I feel like I've had most of them. Um, certainly the shortness of breath, the heart rate, uh, peak were probably the worst or the most worrying. Um, but there was all sorts of other things. I'd get bouts of nausea out of nowhere. Um, certainly you hear a lot of people talk about sound and light sensitivity. That wasn't for me, it was motion. So if I was sitting in the car, that sorts of stuff um the chest pain was horrendous um and that was actually a symptom that really 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 lagged even at the end um yeah the toes <laughs> um covid toes they were horrible um and yeah just just kind of i had lots lots of others were kind of like crept in and out but i think they were probably the main ones mm -hmm. And did you ever um, gain any formal medical diagnostic labels in this process? Not really. I think, I mean, I mentioned the paramedics that came around right right at the start, and they were the ones that said, this is COVID. Um, I didn't ever get a formal test because at that point that wasn't happening. I think you had to be admitted to hospital in order to to get a, a test and they, they weren't testing at that stage no no I don't think so um and you know in, in hindsight I maybe should have been in hospital but anyway again that's probably a, a whole different issue mm -hmm. um I think I mean I had various conversations with doctors on the phone um you know initially like they just didn't have the bandwidth to deal with me um you know they were so busy with all the sort of really, really bad acute cases um, that, you know, me saying, I'm still not getting better. They're like, you know, they were asking all the kind of like triage questions, you know, can you have a com well as breathe? And I was like, well, sort of. And they're like, right, okay, we're not concerned kind of thing. Um, so in some ways it was a relief that I wasn't quite ill enough, um, but also it was kind of like, hello, <laughs> um, you know, like, what am I supposed to do? Um, I think it was about a year 
before I actually saw a doctor in person, mm -hmm. um, by which point I'd already given myself the long COVID label. Um, I don't know if I ever actually officially on doctor's records got that coding, um, but um, you know, they, they were all sort of happy to describe it as, you know, post COVID something or other. Um, so um, I don't think there was anybody who sort of said, oh, well, you never had a positive test. So are you sure it's actually COVID, um, which I know some people did experience. I don't think I ever had that. Um, but yeah, yeah, I suppose it's, um, it is quite hard to remember back to that time. And in some ways, I'd quite like to not remember back to that time. Um, but um, yeah, there was very little anything from the medical professional because they, they were just so overrun. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's where you were at March twenty twenty going on. And where where are you at now? So, recovered. Yes, I am. I am recovered. Um, I I mean, you get people saying this, you know. Oh well, if are you really recovered? Like, can you really do what you could do before? Um, I think you know. I've I've considered myself recovered for what about four or five months now mm -hmm. um, and there was a very strange transition period from you know me saying I mean actually I went in two stages so I got to the point where I thought I'm not sick anymore I don't think I have long COVID anymore but I'm also not recovered you know there's too much stuff um, there's too much other bits and pieces that I couldn't call myself fully recovered um, and I think I sat there for about a month and that kind of allowed me to really kind of push, push the boundaries a bit. And, um, you know, without that kind of like, you know, I think, I think I was still very mindful of things like pacing and not things and everything. And obviously, you know, I was quite unfit and, and all of these things, but I was able to, you know, start doing a little bit more, start thinking, well, maybe I could do a bit more than that. Maybe I could start thinking a little bit about fitness rather than just, you know, doing doing something that I know I can do kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I was there for about a month and then I suddenly, I was actually being interviewed by somebody else at the time. Um, and we were talking about perfectionism because this is something I've understood about myself that I am a bit of a perfectionist. Um, and I was sort of saying, you know, this the understanding about that was quite helpful because I was able to, you know, look at things I was doing or think I was saying or things like that and, and you know, note if I was kind of falling into my perfectionist ways, you know, and I, I think, you know, there are some circumstances where being a perfectionist can be very useful. Um, but there's also like quite a lot like when you're trying to recover, whereas it's extremely unhelpful. And I just, yeah, while I was being interviewed, I suddenly had this huge realization where I thought, oh my goodness, like I'm being a perfectionist about my recovery. I'm absolutely fine. Um, so then at that point, I was then able to be like, right, okay, I'm fine. I'm, I am fine because nobody is perfect. Um, so yeah, I do describe myself as completely recovered. Um, over the last, what, four or five months, I've been able to just really work on my fitness and, you know, working out what I want to do. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I don't think about pacing. I, you know, I think, I think when you go through an experience like this, that, you know, is extremely traumatic, is life changing. It's got all of these things where your life is just ripped out from under you with kind of no warning. And, you know, it's, it makes you think a lot about what is important in your life. I think um, that certainly has been my experience. Um, but I don't think anybody is going to come out the same way they went in. And I think actually quite a big part of my recovery has been understanding that actually the person that went in to this experience was not see as I would have like to think I was, um, I would have equated fitness and health to be very much the same thing. And actually they're not at all. Um, you know, they're related, of course. Um, you know, so I was extremely fit, but looking back to my life before, you know, I was working far too many hours. I was so stressed. 
And then in all my spare time, I was doing exercise, exercise, exercise. I never had a minute for myself. It was constantly switched on and all of these things that I now understand are really, really unhealthy. Um, so, you know, there are so many elements of my life before that I do want to keep, um, you know, I am still very much exercise. Um, I want to be able to handle stress because everybody has stress in their lives. But what I don't want to be doing is being under constant 24 seven stress all the time, because that isn't healthy. Um, so I've taken a massive tangent. Um, because what I'm now realizing is that, you know, having now built my fitness back up again, you know, I'm still not quite as fit as I was before, but that's work in progress, you know, that doesn't happen overnight. Um, but you know, I'm so much healthier. Um, you know, I was, you know, I was mentioning breathing earlier, breathing was one of the things it was the first thing that I found that actually helped. And, you know, I was probably a dysfunctional breather before I got COVID. COVID then massively exacerbated it and it became all these other things. But, you know, that wasn't right beforehand. My lifestyle wasn't right beforehand. Like the idea of switching my brain off, like, I wouldn't have even considered it being a thing that I should do. Whereas now I'm thinking, actually, you need to, you need to have time to do nothing. Um, it's not healthy to never do nothing. Um, so think, I think I'm actually an improvement. I see myself as, as Jackster 2.0. Um, this is, this is the updated version. And, you know, <laughs> I wish I hadn't have had to go through this horrendous experience to have got here. Um, but I really do think that I am, I am an improvement. That doesn't mean everything's perfect. You know, there are, there are a few gifts. <laughs> um, I say gifts, I don't mean gifts because I'd rather not have them. Um, I have a lot more anxiety or I cert I have a lot more anxiety that I'm aware of. Um, I suspect this may have been there in some shape or form beforehand, but because I was so busy doing things, it was kind of like, body's trying to tell me things nope nope we'll just you know put that in a corner I don't know what that is let's not worry about that let's just do more things um so I'm much more aware of that which means it's now something that I'm actively trying to work on um and you know just you know I think there's a huge trauma and um sort of element of something long term like long covid um like anything chronic you know my initial infection there were definitely quite kind of big t trauma elements of that you know lying in bed not knowing you're gonna wake up that's that's pretty traumatic in itself and then i think the kind of longer term sort of illness unknown um constantly kind of feeling awful you know i think that's kind of a longer tail version of it so you know it's it's kind of for me was learning because when someone i finally realized that actually trauma was a thing and i sort of thought well you know that's that's not what i've got because that's what people who like have huge accidents or go to war zones that's what they get that's not what i have um and then when i finally realized that actually it was it was like right well how do i fix that <laughs> and it was like no no we, we we don't fix it so much we learn to live with it and i think um you know, I, I guess that's part of me trying to move forward in a healthier way, I guess. Um, you know, I'm so much more aware of health and wanting to be healthier and be more resilient to things. Because as I said, everybody has stress in their lives and, you know, you don't know what's around the corner. So, you know, I hope that there's not anything too horrendous around the corner because I'm kind of done with that. But at the same time, if it, you know, did, I... I guess I hope that I would handle things, my body would be able to handle things um, slightly better. So one of the things you um, mentioned there is the whole trauma of COVID. Mm. And I think this is massive. It, it, yeah. it, it's the, the societal, it's a societal trauma. It's a collective mm. trauma that we've all lived through. And like you said, in, in the early days, a lot of people didn't really know what was going on. Um, you had the paramedics round. You, you were you weren't you probably should have been in hospital, but you were kept at home. There's often a lot of fear associated with that. Um, so massive collective trauma that that we need to acknowledge. And this is one thing I see with people who who have ongoing symptoms. It is that the impact of the the whole thing is huge and needs to be worked through. Yeah. yeah, I think um, it's it's kind of understanding how that 
fits with the nervous system as well. I mean, you know, I, I think something that I didn't maybe mention was was understanding a, lo a lot of a lot of things was, was understanding what was actually going on. Mm -hmm. I think so much of my first year was like I didn't I didn't know what was going on. So I was trying the only thing that I knew and it wasn't helping. In fact, it was making things worse, um, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't understand what was going on with me. And then when I suddenly did start understanding what was going on with me, you know, people were like, oh, nervous system, oh, this. And then I was like, well, that's something to Google, um, you know, long COVID, you know, it's it's a great ways and people feel a lot of community through that and i completely understand that people like it you know it's patient patient named but in terms of diagnosis it's completely useless um because you know long covid doesn't have a like this is what you do um you know so when i then started understanding what was actually going on for me certainly it was like well okay that's that's more useful now i have something have something that I can look into, um, you know, to try to find my path through it. I mean, you know, it took me a while even after that, but you know, it's, it's, yeah, that understanding was huge. Um, what, but yeah. What did you, what have you learned to understand about the nervous system and the impact of um, all of this on the nervous system? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it goes back to, to pre, you know, I mean, I think, you know, long COVID began before long COVID. <laughs> Sounds really ridiculous, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I think, and I'm, I'm not trying to go into the whole patient blaming thing because I don't think that's appropriate. I think, you know, me looking back at my life before I got ill is, is taking a little bit of responsibility for my health and saying, well, looking at the lifestyle that I was leading beforehand, I wasn't as healthy as I like to think I was. So I was said earlier, my breathing was probably dysfunctional before. Um, I suspect my nervous system was probably a bit dysregulated before. So then when COVID came along, um, it was this humongous trigger. It was a horrible virus, um, but I was kind of on the edge. You know, I'd been fighting a cold off since January. And um, so then when this came along, it was kind of, you know, the, the match to the gasoline kind of thing. Um, so so yeah i mean it's it's absolutely fascinated me i'm very much an answers person i want to know what's going on i want to really understand um so understanding that like this whole there was this whole system in my body that i'd never heard of um and that i think a lot of people had never heard of until suddenly it goes wrong and then you need to try to try to work out what it is um and I think, you know, it's been fascinating for me understanding the impact of different things on your nervous system, what your nervous system does. I mean, it controls everything. Um, so, you know, every list of long COVID symptoms that you go through, you sort of read it down and you think these are all controlled by your nervous system. So, you know, that's why you have such a wide sort of array of symptoms. Um, so, you know, it's yeah. Um, I can't remember where I was going with that. <laughs> I was asking you about, about the nervous system and, and what you've learned about the nervous yes. system and yourself yes, and that's in what relation it was. to long COVID. Yeah. So so I think, yeah, really understanding that, you know, maybe my nervous system was kind of kind of primed beforehand. Um trigger comes along and yeah all of these things that are connected to it so things like your immune system is very connected your diet very connected your mental health very connected you know all of these things kind of play into each other so it's not like separate things that are going wrong in your body so much as it's all connected you know it's a big kind of spider's web isn't it and i um i have this i i need to write it down I have this massive like spider diagram flowchart in my brain um, of how all of these things like relate to each other and how they connect. Um, so, you know, knowing that when you do one thing, it's going to have a, a much wider impact than just on, on the one thing that you're targeting, for example. Um, so, yeah, you know, really kind of understanding all of this and then, you know, understanding the different nervous system states and what that means, what that means you're going to feel in your body at that time um, and how to tell. Because, you know, sometimes people are like, OK, well, you know, what nervous system state are you in? And, you know, you kind of need to work through it sometimes to try and work out, whereas now I'm I know instantly, um, you know, if I feel feel myself getting a bit fight flight, 
then it's like, okay, is this appropriate? Actually, yeah, it is appropriate right now. Okay, well, that's fine. Or are we starting to get a bit anxious? Are we starting to, you know, is the stone starting to roll down the hill? Do we need to downregulate a little bit here? Right, let's just close my eyes for 30 seconds and do some breathing. Um, and this is something that I do a lot if I'm spending time in front of my computer. Um, and I can get very tunnel vision. So, uh, so, you know, if I've spent an hour preparing something, then it's like, right, okay. Yeah, let's let's just take a moment. And it only takes me maybe 10 seconds to sort of get back and I'll be fine. Whereas, you know, before I would have had to have gone and lied down for an hour and, you know, <laughs> done all of these things. But um, which I suppose goes to show that my nervous system is now so much more resilient than it was. Um, so I suppose that's the proof in the pudding, isn't it, really? Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, the understanding I don't know if healthy people is even the right word, um, but you know, someone who doesn't have long COVID, they they flip between all of these things, and that is healthy. We need to be able to flip between all of the states. Um, you know that that is what a health, is, but the healthy person doesn't get stuck there. Um, and I think that was the real kind of thing for me. It was like, right, I now understand that I am stuck in fight flight. I am stuck in freeze. I'm not really able to access the nice happy green zone where all the healing happens so how do i get my body to spend more time there spend more time healing because that is what we want that is the end game <laughs> that i mean you've just described everything so nicely this kind of it summarizes the work i do when i work with people so so one of the things i've noticed is like like you you say that uh, it, it was like you your nervous system was primed for this mm -hmm. even before covid uh, and I, I see a number of people who there was something that went before. So whether they had a, a chronic mind body health condition, whether they had an underlying anxiety, whether just the buildup of stress. So they, they were on the edge and on the edge of burnout. Their system was just overloaded. And then you get a trigger, which was COVID. Yeah. Um, and then that has. And like you said, off, your, your nervous system was probably dysregulated beforehand. Your breathing was dysregulated beforehand which is interlinked with the nervous system so like if your breathing is dysregulated why is it dysregulated there's usually a reason for that um and then again the nervous system states this is key understanding what is going on from a nervous system point of view and most people will say um and they're in they're in a fight flight i'm i'm always in that fight flight there's a threat, but there isn't a threat. Nervous system is seeing or feeling a perceived threat, even though that threat isn't there. Or even freeze. The freeze state is often this collapse, shutdown, immobility, can't move, fatigue um, state. And, and as you say, we're all in and out of these states, and that's normal, but it's when you get stuck there, then it, it's kind of immo immobilize you. Um so tell me what are the things that have made a difference how is it you've got to this place of recovery what are your key things that have come your way that have really helped you i know you've mentioned breathing already but i know there's a whole stack of more things that are there yeah so i meant yeah i mentioned breathing i mean <laughs> breathing is my current rabbit hole um but uh, that really was the first thing I and mean, again this is something that i've noticed from myself but also from speaking to a lot of other people is that that first thing is so important because you know you're you're flailing you know you've got all of these things going wrong in your body and you don't know what's going on and suddenly almost overnight you've come down with like 20 different health conditions how is this even possible um and then you know maybe you start getting a bit of understanding and you start targeting or maybe you just find something and you think oh my goodness that worked why did that work okay um and I, it was almost the latter you know i someone said breathing will help you and i was like well, I'll give it a try. Um, and then once I then started noticing that, huh, breathing is helping. Okay, now I want to know why. <laughs> um, so yeah, I discovered that my breathing was dysfunctional. Um, you know, I was basically chronic hyperventilating. Um, uh, so I basically had to work to correct that um, to make my breathing functional. And then once I'd done that, I was able to use the sort of power of breathing to influence the nervous system. So it was almost like there were two kind of hand in hand kind of 
adapt to the breathing it was fix it and then use it um you know use you know harness that power of it um and that is something to this day whenever i feel slightly stressed breathing is always my go-to um so that really was the first thing um from then that um the guy that i was doing breathing with he was talking about things like yoga nidras um and you know up up to this point i'd been very much a kind of like doctors are geniuses when you get sick you go to the doctor they make you better you know i was very fortunate that i'd been ill um so you know i i kind of had this like ridiculous faith in doctors and medicine and men in white coats and um and then I suddenly have now discovered this other world of things that are, I was going to say, like, just as important, just as good. But actually, I think certainly in my experience of long COVID, much more helpful than I've ever spoken to has been. Um, so anyway, I tangent. Um, yeah, so yoga nidra was the next thing that I kind of found or was kind of directed towards. And I have a very busy mind. I always have, and it never, I never considered that this wasn't normal. And it's only through kind of really speaking to other people and starting to understand more about myself. I have discovered that not everyone's brain does this. Um, so uh, my partner and I, we call it braining. Um, so when I get very excited or when I have ideas, you know, I, I brain, I brain all over the place. I brain a lot. Um, and like I just don't know how to turn it off and some people seem to be able to just do it um so my partner will sit down on the sofa and he will just turn himself off don't understand how he can do that I I envy him in some ways um so things like yoga nidra that was the only way I could really get to rest cognitively as well as physically you know we I was getting better at understanding that I needed to physically rest my body I didn't like it and I didn't want to do it, but I was certainly starting to do it more um, or learning when to do it. But yeah, you know, I'd be lying on the sofa thinking, well, I'm resting, but my brain was still going round and round and round in circles. So the yoga nidra was about the only way that I could really get to do that. Um, I finally managed to get some sort of cognitive rest. And um, someone asked me the other day, they were like, well, if you're trying so many different things, how do you know which one it is that's helping? Um, and I think, you know, I've got a big three, the breathing, the nidra, and then the cold water, which I'll talk about in a moment. And, um, and the reason they were the big three is because they're the ones that I noticed instantly helped. So, you know, I calmed my breathing instantly, things would improve. I did a yoga nidra, you know, 20 minutes later, I'd be like, okay, yeah. I feel slightly less fatigued or that symptom is slightly less bad than it was, or I feel slightly clearer or, you know, whatever it was. Uh, so yeah, the third one was the cold water. And again, this is something that actually breathing guy also had been talking about because he'd been doing. Um, and I just thought that sounds horrendous. Why would you want to do that? Um, but then eventually I thought, well, okay, let's give it a try. So, you know, I, um, I'm in Inverness, we've got Loch Ness just down the road. I thought, well, it'll make a good picture, even if nothing else. Um, so we went down there, this was 2022. So this was about two years in, um, and I guess about 18 months ago from now. Um, and I sort of, you know, got into the water very, very, very slowly, got up to my neck, was like, right, I'm done, <laughs> get me out of here. Um, and, um, you know, once I'd sort of got over the horror of it and sort of got dressed and got my warm clothes back on, I thought, huh, I do feel better. And it didn't last. Um, but over time, you know, after that first time where I thought, okay, that did actually make a difference, I just kept doing it. So, you know, to start with, I'd get in the water and I would spend, you know, I'd be in for 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes. Um, and over time, I was able to stay in a little bit longer. I'd then actually start moving. I'd actually start swimming. Um, and yeah, over time, you know, I was going maybe two, three, four times a week, depending on the week. Um, and yeah, you know, the 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 distance, you know, the, the effects would last longer each time over time. Um, so 
I thought, right, well, I always feel better after a swim. So if I want to go and try doing something, we go for the swim first and then we try the walk. Um, and so it would actually work quite well. With the cold water exposure, what do you think is going on from a nervous system perspective? Yeah. So then this is something that I am so interested in. Um, so, you know, you, you get into that water and I the person, but you've probably come across Jill Bolt Taylor um, and the step to the right. Um, so this is a person who I think had a stroke in the left hand side of her brain. Um, she was like a neuroscientist. Um, and the left side of our brain is where we have all the logical overthinking kind of stuff that goes on. And she'd had a stroke there. So she was fully in her right side of her brain. And she was like, you know, <laughs> everything was great. Um, and, um, and I think she she studied, she's done a TED talk or something. She's amazing. Um, and um, yeah, but she developed, we need to take a step to the right. You know, we can't spend all our time there because we need that other side of our brain to actually function. Um, but um, yeah, and so basically what the cold water allowed me to do was really to get out of my brain, get out of my own head. Because when you go into that water, overthinking, you're not worrying about all the stuff. You are literally think, well, I won't swear on here, but you know, you're, <laughs> you're going in there and you're thinking, this is really cold. Your focus is very much on what you're doing there. Um, and you're just, you're just float, you know, I mean, one of my favorite things to do in, in the water in the summer was just to lie on my back and float and look at the sky. And it's just so incredibly relaxing, but it's like, as, as you're going in, you know, it's, it's that bit where you've got your two nervous system sort of states, you've got your parasympathetic fighting, your sympathetic kind of thing. So I think there's a really good book about this. I think as you're going in, you're starting to get slightly sympathetic um, because your body's going threat, <laughs> threat. <laughs> um, and then once you're mm. in, you get parasympathetic taking over. So that's why your instinct when you go into the water is to hyperventilate, which is why I couldn't have done this to start with. This is why it was so important for me that the breathing came first. Because if I'd gone into the water, I was already hyperventilating. Um, so, you know, that wouldn't have been a good idea for many obvious reasons. Um, so it's, it's absolutely fascinating. But all you need to do is stay in for about 90 seconds, two minutes. Um, you know, so, so people who are like, oh, I need to go and stay in for ages. You know, you've got to stay in 10 minutes to make it worth it. <laughs> That's absolutely rubbish. Um, so, um, you know, especially when it's getting colder, you just you just don't need to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the benefits for that, you know, obviously nervous system is huge. You know, you're just really training that kind of resiliency. Um, but, you know, I think it was important for me, certainly, to do it in a gentle way. Because if you push yourself too hard, then, you know, you're you're going to um, gonna end up pushing yourself into a crash or whatever. Um, but I have to admit, I never came out of that water feeling worse than when I would went in. Um, you know, every time I got into the water, I always came out feeling better. I maybe didn't come out feeling as much better as I wanted to, um, but it would always improve things. Um, and that included a few times where I was feeling really, really, really terrible. And Malky literally kind of put me in the car and basically like carried me into the water almost, um, you know, and, and I didn't stay in very long, but I got out and I thought, okay, that, that was the right decision. You know, that's slightly better. Um, but you know, yeah, the, the benefits of it are massive. You've got your, obviously your nervous system, it's anti-inflammatory. That's another one of these buzzwords, isn't it? We talk a lot about inflammation in long COVID. Um, you know, you've got supported movement because you're in the water. So I think, you know, movement is important. Calling it exercise is not appropriate because it's different for different people. But certainly for me, you know, I was able to move supported. Um, and where was I going? Yeah, mental health. Again, for me, I'm an outdoor person. You know, I was trying to do too much. I was doing less, I was doing less, I was doing less. And it was almost like I was feeling physically slightly better, but mentally worse because I wasn't doing anything that was bringing me joy. You know, all of the things that I enjoyed were the things that I had to stop or do less of. So I was then having this kind of like, fight between the physical and the mental health and it's like well i know physically i shouldn't go and do this but actually mentally i need to do something um so it was trying to kind of find a balance of 
what can I do? You know, how much can I do? Um, so I think, you know, the cold water was a huge thing for me. It was a way that I could do something outdoors, um, but do something outdoors that was good for me rather than some of the other things that were sometimes good for me and sometimes not. Um, I wasn't, le- I was less good at judging other things for sure. Well, one of the things I found really helpful when, when I was at my worst with pots is to think, well, what, what are the things I can't do? But what it, why do I feel the need to do? What are the yeah. key important components? So yeah. like you, exercise was super important. So I very much into outdoor pursuits, hill walking, um, climbing, biking. And I kind of broke it down to, well, why, why am I so driven to do these things? Number one, it's being outside. Number two, it's being with people. So then it's taking those things and think, well, what else can I do that's outside and with people? that meets those needs, but without necessarily riding a bike or going up a mountain. Um, and you just kind of described that re- really well. It's like being outside. Okay, cold water and movement. I can move in cold water. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So in, anything else in terms of key key things? So you mentioned breathing, you mentioned yoga nidra, you mentioned cold water exposure. Um, what, what, what are your, your other sort of key things that have made a difference to you? Um, I'd say they were the three big ones. Um, I tried lots of other things. Um, I think actually possibly one of the biggest other things that I wouldn't include in my top three, but actually probably should be kind of sitting next to it was speaking to a counsellor. I didn't think I needed to because I thought, well, that's what my partner's for. And I got a bit of a grilling from someone that I interviewed when I said something along those lines. And they said, oh, my goodness, you can't do that to him. That's not fair. And at that point, I went, oh, my goodness, you're right. Um, So I started speaking to a counsellor. And honestly, I don't think I want to get rid of You know, I want to I'm still speaking to her now um you know trying to navigate this post post recovery kind of thing um so she's been absolutely amazing because you know i mean we've kind of touched on the mental health side of this and you know we all focus on the physical symptoms because they're so kind of this but you know i think mentally it's so so tough you know you're trying these things and you're constantly picking yourself back up when they don't work or you know every time you crash it's like oh here we go again so she's been absolutely amazing um sort of throughout just kind of trying to help me mentally navigate what was going on physically and certainly trying to help me get out of any kind of like mental pitfalls that would then start riffing off all the other stuff and making the other stuff work so she was brilliant um other things i did the safe and sound protocol um which was very very interesting so this is a polyvagal intervention where basically you listen to filtered music uh, and this interested me so much that i actually trained in it so now i can administer it myself mm-hmm. um well, you know not myself to to other people <laughs> if that makes sense um so that that helped um one of the coolest benefits that i actually noticed from that was that i now hear it's all you know you know the bit in the wizard of oz where it goes from gray you know black and white to color I feel like my hearing did that. Um, so I'm a musician. That's what I did before. Um, and now when I play music, it's like I'm hearing tones I'm hearing frequencies that I never heard before. Um, so that was super cool. Um, what else did I do? I tried, I tried changing my diet. I tried all of the sort of things that people talk about the low histamine, the anti-inflammatory. Um, I tried cutting out things like dairy. Um, I don't, they no noticeable difference. Um, I tried all the supplements and then gave up when I realized how expensive they were and they weren't actually doing anything. Um, I tried all sorts of other things. Um, possibly the most useful of the other things was I did Susie Bolt's Fern program. And that was that was what kind of, I think that was the end of February into kind of March time um, this year that I did that. And um, I think at that point, I was struggling with a whole load of kind of anxieties about I'm doing slightly better, but I'm sort of not wanting. I was too too scared to try to do anything because I was so scared of pushing myself back. Um, and I had so many anxieties around things like reinfection. And to be fair, I still have quite a lot of them. Um, but it was it was kind of um, I found it very useful to kind of help me see life beyond illness 
Um, so by that point, I, I was actually much more recovered than I gave myself credit for. Um, and that really allowed me to kind of, yeah, step outside it and allow myself to go, there is a me that is separate from this illness. And, you know, the, the future is there. And, you know, throughout all of this, I'd just been, you know, so desperate to recover. You know, I would try anything. I'd, you know, do all of these things and things were getting so much better. And it was, I don't, I don't even know kind of how to describe it. It was kind of like when it was almost there, it was like, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> um, and, um, and I think that was something that kind of continued in the kind of aftermath, you know, once I then had recovered. Um, but um, I think what Fern Program really did for me was it allowed me to go, I'm not ill anymore. So that that really was the trigger for that. I'm not ill anymore. I'm not better, but I'm not ill anymore kind of transition, um, which I then from there was able to then move on to actually I'm recovered um, and then transitioning from I'm recovered. But what on earth does my life look like? I need to kind of, you know, work out what's going on. And the, the whole transition period was very, very strange uh, to me now where I'm like, I don't worry about long COVID anymore. I think to start with, I very much was worried doing too much, pushing myself too hard because that's what I did before. Um, and it was kind of like, you know, I need to be careful not to do too much, not to push my body too hard because I don't want to put myself back in that position. And I think I just know myself much better now. So now I know where my limits are or I know I actually listen to what my body's telling me. So like the last couple of weeks have been super stressful because I've been trying to set up a business. Um, and, you know, yesterday, yesterday evening, I taught my first class and this morning I took the morning off. Um, so I've clearly learned something about boundaries. So, so tell us about your business. What have um, you done with all of this? Yeah, so I think... Um, something there was a quote that somebody told me that I while I was interviewing them um and I, I'll paraphrase because I can't remember exactly what it was or who said it um but they said something along the lines of experiences equal to things like qualifications um so if somebody had spent say three years doing a PhD then obviously they are very qualified in their subject and they have a bit of paper to say it and they have all of these things um but somebody like myself for example who's three plus years with chronic illness and learning about all of these things that is also kind of kind of equal you know all of those learnings all of that experience all of what I've gained from it um I think very much and I think hearing that quote when it made me go oh and I'm also a very kind of opt I'm an eternal optimist I think um you know I really wanted to be able to take something from this experience so rather than looking back on it and saying well that was a waste of three and a half years um and yeah okay in some ways it was it was horrendous but you know being able to kind of take that and use it um so I trained as a Botaco breathing instructor because I thought right well I have a lot to offer here because I understand breathing. I understand breathing with long COVID. Um, you know, I understand coming out of long COVID and going forward with breathing. Um, so I have set up with uh, with Vicky Jones. She's uh, also a long hauler. Uh, we've set up breathing for long COVID um, where we are running courses specifically for people with long COVID. Um, we're doing six week courses, 12 sessions where we're kind of just really kind of zeroing in on that um, very kind of specific to things like nervous system. Um, so a lot of sort of breathing courses tend to be aimed a bit high because mm -hmm. They don't understand, you know, it's, it's one of these things where you can't understand it until you've been through it yourself. Um, you know, and I would have not understood things like trauma, things like nervous system, things like how little you need to push people before they can sort of go over the edge into a crash. So, so really trying to kind of tailor this to people. So adapting exercises and actually just taking them way down. Um, so, 
so we're kind of really taking the kind of trial and error out because when I started learning breathing and all of these things um I was trying to do too much because I was thinking oh well you know that's that's what they're saying so I can definitely do that I was sort of constantly crashing putting myself in a trauma response because you know it was too much but I didn't understand why um so so I think yeah this is coming back to where you know I have so much to offer in this I as much as anybody can I get it I think you know and Vicky is the same Vicky's a long hauler she she just understands the potential pitfalls she knows where these people are coming from um in as in so much as anybody can you know and I think as well just acknowledging that actually we don't know all the answers or certainly that we're not the experts of these other people who are coming to us you know they need to know when to stop they need to know to learn their own bodies and that's what we're going to try to help them with through breathing which is something that i just believe in so strongly because it's been so instrumental in my own recovery and just in my own day-to-day life now um you know just with regulating myself i mean before i came on here today i was thinking you know i was doing the sort of flapping around where i'm like right i need to make sure my camera's right there is the light okay have i got my tea have i and I thought, no, we're overthinking. Should we just stop and breathe for a second? Um, and then everything was fine. <laughs> so just to um, kind of summarise, if you had any sort of top tips for someone who's still struggling, what would they be? Oh, gosh. Um, I think certainly to be open-minded, all the things that helped me were things that I would have poo-pooed four years ago. Um, you know, I would have said, you know, nope, and the, the doctor's going to tell me what to do. They're going to fix me. And, you know, I just need to wait for that silver bullet cure and, you know, breathing and yoga and cold water all sounds a bit woo-woo. Um, whereas <laughs> they were the things that helped, you know, that that is why I'm here today. And I spent last week climbing hills, um, you know, so... So I think, yeah, you know, being being open minded, um, you know, not everything will work for everybody. Um, so being open minded and trying things, but also, you know, trying not to then sort of blame yourself when things don't go wrong, because what works for me isn't going to be exactly the same as what works for everybody else. That's why, you know, all these recovery stories are so important, because nobody's recovery is going to be a carbon copy of anybody else's. Um, so, you know, you could go away and try breathing yoga need during cold water, but you're probably going to need to add your own spice to that. Um, I think, um, you know, f- find the support, but the right sort of support. Um, so I think, you know, I think a lot of support groups can be very negative. Support groups can be incredibly powerful, um, you know, and I think there are a lot of them that are really, really great. But I definitely needed to know when to kind of get out of them or certainly when to sort of mute them a bit, because I definitely realized at one point that I was scrolling through Facebook and every single post was someone in a support group, you know, saying how terrible what things were and like, yeah, you know, they were terrible. And, you know, I feel for all these people and it's awful and I know what they feel because they've been there. But at the same time, if that's all you're ever um. So I, so I think, um, you know, that's not, not always healthy. So knowing, knowing what to consume and when, um, and, uh, that, that was definitely something that was useful. Um, and I think just don't ever lose sight of that hope. Um, again, this is another reason why recovery stories are so important because they remind us that other people have recovered. So if that person's recovered, so can I. Um, you know, the first person that I spoke to how, who had recovered was such a big moment for me because it made me realize that it could. And I think that's so, so, so important because if we lose that belief, then, you know, it's it's just another mental blow on top of everything else. But we also stop trying things if we lose that belief. So I think, you know, keep keep that belief in recovery. I think that was fundamentally so important. It certainly was for me. Yeah, that's amazing. And um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Um, so, so we'll welcome. leave it there. What I'm going to do, a number of the, the um, 
things that have been mentioned, I, I will uh, add a link to the show notes. So um, safe and sound protocol, and there's one or two other things there. Um, so if you want to find out more about work Jackie's doing, I will I will post. So thank you again, Jackie, very much for coming to um, chat. Oh, you're so welcome. It's been great.